Marcus Weisgerber from Defense One here, and I'm joined now by Mackenzie Elin of the American Enterprise Institute and Stacey Pettyjohn of the Brand Corporation. And over the next uh, 40 minutes or so, we're going to unpack a bit of what we just talked about with General, General Brown. So uh, Mackenzie, Stacy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Marcus. I, I want to go, uh, so let's just maybe start with uh, General Brown's vision, his vision document, accelerate change or, or lose. I feel like we're going to be hearing a lot about this in the coming you know, weeks, months, and uh, perhaps years ahead. Is there anything uh, to either of you, I, I'll pose it to both of you, maybe Stacy, start, Mackenzie, you follow up. Is there, is there anything in, in that document that really uh, stands out to you or strikes you as an area where, uh, you know, it, 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 hey, this would be great or, hey, he's going to have a lot of trouble doing this? Sure. Uh, thanks, Marcus. I, I think it's a really interesting document right now. It's a call to action. Um, he correctly, I think, diagnoses the problem, the fact that the U.S. conventional military dominance is not assured going forward um, and is arguing that we need to take steps more quickly to remedy this situation because this is something that DOD has known um, for years or in some cases decades. They've been talking about the problem of Chinese precision guided conventional um, ballistic and cruise missiles, the threat to fixed air bases, the threat to surface vessels, um, and little has actually been done to change the way that the U.S. military plans to fight and uh, to remedy some of the vulnerabilities that currently exist. So he's saying that we need to stop admiring the problem and actually get to it and begin to fix this. Right now, um, the document is a little bit short on details. Um, it's really trying to mobilize people and to energize them, I think, and to suggest that things are going to be different as they go forward. He still needs to lay out what the plan is in terms of the right mix of forces and capabilities that the Air Force needs to deal with these great power challengers in the future. And I think there's a bit of an issue with the document in terms of who the primary audience is. Is he talking internally to the US Air Force now that the Space Force has broken up, trying to help to reinforce the culture and identity of the service and um, help airmen understand what their core purpose and mission is? Or is he also trying to talk to um, external audiences within the uh, Department of Defense, on Capitol Hill and others whose support is necessary to implement these changes. And I think it's a bit of both right now and he'll need those messages to be in line with one another, but they might need to be somewhat tailored um, to the different audiences to resonate with them and have the desired effect. Mm -hmm. How about you, Mackenzie? I think Stacy has a good accurate summary that it's a call to action and it's a call to action with a really stark uh, outlining of the terms of that debate and the rationale for the call to action, right? So he's not just saying we need to change because change is what we're just supposed to do in uniform and just hurry up and change, although that kind of feels that way sometimes, uh, but change for a lot of different reasons. Change because we've been studied while we've been busy uh, the services while they've been busy prosecuting other types of missions, that they're being outmatched and outgunned and out even spent in some cases uh, by competitors, that the risk has grown to the point where if a large scale high end conflict were to break out in short order of some sort, not necessarily with the obvious uh, countries, but just of any kind, that the Air Force and to some extent the Department of Defense risks a lot more than just potentially losing a battle. It risks obviously losing airmen, but losing capital assets to a significant eye-catching degree by America, uh, of losing credibility, of losing, losing influence, and losing the ability to, to basically keep the peace, the liberal international order, and the rules-based system. That's a, that's a pretty clearing call for saying what's at risk. And, and, and I don't think it's exclusive to the Air Force. And he talks about many sort of broad themes about why to change and potentially avenues to pursue. Uh, but I agree that this was meant to be a vision document. So it's, it's missing some of the more details that you might expect. But I believe the chief understands that he has to even win this base case first. The Air Force has no track record of assuming anyone's gonna read this and listen to it and change. And so 
until he can give details of the kind that Stacy referenced, first, I think he wants to know that anyone's paying attention. So, to, to let's dig a little bit deeper into that. What, what are, so as you mentioned, it, it, it's light on details as we were just talking uh, uh, before we came into this, we were talking about, um, uh, you know, kind of this balance between uh, capability, c capability and presence. What, what do you, what do you both foresee as some of the force structure uh, or changes that the Air Force just needs to make uh, in, in this era of great power competition that's envisioned? Sure. Uh, there's, I mean, there's a mix. They've been trying for several years to divest of some legacy platforms that they know aren't as useful in the future fights because they're not survivable when air dominance is not guaranteed as it wouldn't be in any sort of conflict with China or Russia. Um, so uh, I believe the B1's been considered as being on the chopping block, the A-10, some of the unmanned aerial systems like uh, the Reaper um, that aren't survivable as well. And those are useful in theaters that have a more permissive environment like the Middle East or Africa, but not, not so much for these future fights. Um, some of my colleagues have done a lot of work trying to help the Air Force think about what force mix is appropriate going forward. Um, Dave Ackmanik and his colleagues have been looking at um, using low cost or tritable unmanned aircraft um, yeah. as an alternative um, and supplement to the existing force structure that helps to generate the mass that the Air Force needs um, and creates a mesh targeting network which will help them to operate and survive uh, within a high threat environment inside of the anti-access aerial denial, denial envelope in, for example, the first island chain and um, thinks that that is one part of the future where the Air Force needs to invest. It's not just big uh, manned uh, platforms like the B-21 or um, F-15X, F-35. It's other different types of platforms and a different mix than we've ever seen before. In addition to the air battle management system, which is this distributed structure for command and control that's supposed to replace JSTARS and um, AWACS and uh, the existing platforms and um, uh, but the specifics of that are still being fleshed out so there's a lot of aspirations toward these new distributed systems that are hopefully going to be more resilient um, but uh, it requires um, reducing capacity probably in the short term to be able to uh, repurpose the funds towards modernization. Mm -hmm. And as you, you mentioned, the, you know, the, re the, the, the shedding capacity part has not been uh, welcomed, uh, or well received, I should say, by, by, by Congress. Uh, Mackenzie, how, you know, I, I asked General Brown this, and I've asked Air Force leaders this forever. How, how does the Air Force get, uh, get Congress to buy into this vision of, you know, of re retiring in, in order to modernize? And then to build on that, does does the disclosure of this, you know, NGAD uh, plane or wh whatever whatever it is that that you know that that was disclosed last week, this assumingly assuming a fighter jet or something that flew, it was designed and flew very very quickly, and according to Dr. Roper, the head of Air Force acquisition, broke a whole a whole bunch of records. Does does the disclosure that the Air Force is actually doing that help help it or help it make its case to Congress and say, hey, look? we're doing, we're able to do stuff and we're able to act, we'll be able, if you let us have some, you know, retirement of aircraft, that money could be repurposed towards something like this where we can actually move fast. So interestingly in the document, I, I parsed his words like any nerd would do. And, you know, when he talks about risk, he also talks about sharing risk among stakeholders. And he also, you know, he says other things like better relationships. So he clearly understands what the chiefs before him have clearly got on the phone with him and talked him through all of their battle scars from policy fights in Washington. And he, he sees that clearly, even though he's not of this town. And when he talks about balancing and sharing risk, what um, better among the stakeholders, the first word he uses is that he needs all of the other stakeholders outside of the Air Force to acknowledge balance and share the risk. So I think if you wear the Air Force uniform and you've been at that level, 
you think, and I, I think with a good case to be made, that you've disproportionately borne the risk of defense cuts really since 2010 in that nadir. Uh, defense budgets rose a little bit, went dropped again, uh, bottomed out again in 2015, started rising again in 2017. But anyway, so that's that's typical. But if you look across the uh, enterprise of defense, the Air Force has, has taken a hard hit. I remember Deputy Secretary of Defense at the time, Bob Workman, I met with him in the job and you know, I'd been writing Air Force, the Air Force articles, the Air Force is dying. Uh, you know, and I sat down with him. He was like, wow, the first review I did was on the Air Force. And gee, who knew? You know, it was at rock bottom, basically, as a service. And I said, well, you know, like, not everybody knew, but it, the warning signs were there. And he uses that exact term. The warning signs have been blinking for some time. So the first thing he has to do, again, is not just build better relationships, but convince others that the Air Force uh, needs to better, the, uh, across the enterprise, the risk has to be better shared. Um, that can be read in a variety of ways. I don't think there's one solution to that, but I certainly think there's some some sharing to be done. On the NGAD, I thought it was really interesting, Marcus, that the chief called it software. He specifically described it as a software program. So it's not a much less like a flying prototype jet. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'll let smarter people sort of, you know, parse those words. I'll parse his vision document words. Um, but that was an interesting characterization, probably more accurate. You know, I would say that Dr. Roper has really been a, a one-man army trying to push his ideas uh, into reality. And until now, he hasn't had a lot to show for that. He hasn't been in a single job long enough to manifest and yield real fruit, the kind that you can sort of kick the tires and people can evaluate and say, we like it, we don't like it. This is really his first uh, major entree into taking an idea and putting it into reality and into action. Last year, the House, I think... Um, the House Appropriations Bill just cut NGAD in half, whacked it and said, you know, too much risk, too vague, not really sure what it is. That's kind of been the trend. Congress says out of one side of their mouth, we really want you to be all next gen and in bed with tech and find new ways of doing things. And then the services try and do that and Congress takes a schwack at the funding because they're not the traditional type of programs. I actually think this is a potential major leap forward in terms of upending acquisition, but then it makes it a bigger target. So now that's going to be in the crosshairs of every prime contractor saying you're going to you're going to rupture the model where we are incentivized towards sustainment as opposed to new production. Is is it possible, um, Stacy, for the uh, for the Air Force to make you know meaningful changes if if Congress is you know um, if if they repeatedly reject uh, reject you know these proposals for you know, air, aircraft retirements, or does the Air Force just need to go back to the drawing board and come up with, you know, a new, a new way uh, to come about and, and make, you know, make these changes that they want to make yeah. without retirements? I, I mean, I think all of the services right now in a budget constrained environment, at least neutral, but in all likelihood shrinking fairly significantly have to uh, make trade-offs. And that means they're going to have to either do less, do less and or give up different things. And um, that means divesting of some uh, platforms potentially. You might want to think about missions that they might want to do, not want to do anymore. Things like uh, the presence mission, um, focusing on fighting terrorists, um, those sort of uh, lesser priority threats in the NDS. I think this is really all about prioritization and making choices because we're not um, foreseeing a, a world as we go forward where budgets are going to grow significantly. And um, even in the past decade when the budget was growing um, before se sequestration in the Budget Control Act, um, they weren't making the hard choices. Um, this is kind of what General Brown seems to be pointing towards and saying that now is the point, you know, we can still fix this problem and figure out a way forward if we let the balance shift too much farther against us where our adversaries have more of an edge. We're not going to be able to correct it. We really need to make hard choices now. And that involves giving some things up. And you do see the other services doing this as well. The Marines have um, made some difficult choices, um, though I don't think they face the same amount of um, uh, opposition on the Hill as the Air Force has. So that's a great segue because I, I I have as my next que next question you know General Brown uh, uh, and and General General Berger the Commandant of the Marine Corps are often 
uh, compared to one another just due, due to the uh, changes they want to make to their each of their services. Why, why does, uh, one, who do you think will be more successful at implementing a long-term change? And, you know, Stacy, you alluded to it there, you know, what, uh, why is there less opposition uh, to do what the Marines want to do? And they, they want to, re- you know, do things like re- retire, re- retire tanks. And if I'm correct, I believe it was reduce uh, uh, squ- helicopter squadrons and stuff like that. Uh, why, why is there su- such a, I guess, disparity uh, in the views? Uh, Mackenzie, you want to kick us off? Sure, and I, I do hope Stacy will jump in. So again, this chief is at square one, whereas the commandant's at square five. So this chief doesn't have consensus around the need to change. The, he's fighting inertia and entrenched bureaucracy as well as parochial interests that are harder to move than almost anything else. And so, right, so he ha- as, as I was saying before, he has to win this discussion first. And some of that is directly with the Office of the Secretary of Defense then it is with Capitol Hill, but th- those are two distinct uh, categories of stakeholders. There's some within the Air Force, sure. So this is the why do we need to change and please agree with me, whereas the Commandant is more of how we're going to change. And what's interesting, while the Commandant has really received, I, I think, mostly positive feedback, uh, at the same time, you know, you can't discount how disjointed it was from Big Navy, who has yet to you know, granted, there's been a lot of turnover, unfortunately, civilian and uniform at the top, but uh, it was a little bizarre that the Commandant's um, guidance came out absent the CNOs alongside of his when it's a more of a call to return to the sea. So, you know, there's a lot going on there behind the, the curtain, if you will, and it's, it's, that it's causing trouble, whereas um, if you roll it out the right way, now granted, you know, General Brown has to think not Similarly about the Space Force, they're still linked uh, financially and in other ways, uh, they're joined at the hip as they should be for the time being. So, you know, he does need to be still a partner. I think the how will come, the the more details on the how. Some of it's gonna be not about what to do new, but uh, about what not to do. I know Stacey said that, I've said it too before. He's very much of the mindset that uh, where the Navy was maybe 10 years ago, I see two themes emergent in the Air Force today. Um, It's sort of the demands of the high-end fight and war fighting and deterrence versus presence and assurance and persuasion and all of the other sort of types of missions that, that keep everybody in the military flying, steaming and driving every day around the world. That and then people payload and effects versus platforms. Washington's still a very platform place, even though they they like the ideas, like the Commandant and others have spoken of, will there be money behind the Commandant's changes, Marcus? And that's still, like you talked about, those are still dramatic and a great big unknown. Stacey, you have anything to add? Sure, I mean, I think Mackenzie hit the nail on the head in terms of uh, General Brown's at a different point in this process than um, uh, the Marines are. I also think there's a scale difference and a antecedent conditions difference. The Marines have much better relationship on the Hill and have tended to have strong supporters there. Um, And the changes, I mean, the Marine Corps is a much smaller service, so it's not as widespread of effects as the Air Force is. Um, The Air Force is kind of in a situation where they're dealing with a lot of change internally and externally at the same time with the creation of a separate service within the department and all of the implications of that are still being worked out as they figure out um, exactly what the relationship between the two of them will be going forward and reassess uh, what it means to for the Air Force um, um, in terms of their organization and um, the, the missions and responsibilities that they have. Mm-hmm. So does the Space Force, you know, so does that become the, you know, the, I know they're organized the same way the Navy and the Marine Corps are, but does that now become for the Air Force, the, the, the you know, the, the competitor for, for cash, you know, everyone wants to talk about space, everyone wants to talk about the threat that's uh, up, up in space right now. And um, the, the more I listen to, earnings calls uh, with CEOs that are talking about, you know, all these classified multi-billion dollar space contracts they're getting. So I guess does the Space Force now make it more difficult 
um, for the, the Air Force to, uh, to make, make its argument. And then in turn, you know, what, what, what uh, I guess, so what, what how, how does the Air Force, you know, how do they form their relationship? Uh, you know, they're clearly gonna be natural competitors, but how do you, how do you go about forming that relationship where, you know, both, both uh, branches are able to uh, get, get their needs and modernize? I mean, it's definitely a tricky situation, um, but I think that uh, General Brown has identified it as one of the factors that has made this a moment amenable to change. You have this huge disruption that's occurring for reasons that were out of the Air Force's control, and that gives them him an opportunity to make other changes as a result of that. And since the Space Force is emphasizing a lot of the attributes that <clears throat> General Brown has also started to emphasize agility, smaller, you know, uh, attracting a different type of person to the service, trying to be more agile and lean. Um, I think that these are things that uh, the Air Force is interested in, that there obviously um, could be competition for resources and probably will be at some point, but I think General Raymond and General Brown are trying to approach this very collaboratively as uh, General Raymond and General Goldfein were previously, and in some ways, um, this helps the Air Force with one of the issues that they've struggled with, which is all of the money that passes through their budget that um, is uh, to classified systems that they, they isn't actually for the Air Force. They can actually um, pull that out now more easily and show what they're actually getting for the Air Force itself. Mackenzie, anything to add on that one? Just that it's it's a smart approach to jump together and link arms and stay close, uh, the two chiefs. But the reality is, I think this could fracture sooner than later, even though I hope sincerely it does not. The reason the Air Force might just prevail finally in, in the pass through debate and getting that off of their books, getting the black funding out of the blue Air Force budget is because of the disruption of the, of the standing up of the Space Force a little sooner than I think uh, service leaders had expected with the overwhelming votes in Congress. Uh, at the same time, you have the space boss saying we're going to need a lot more money and that's, that's that has nothing to do with the pass through and uh, if that's when you're looking and staring down a flat top line, well then the that becomes a you know fratricide situation among the services. And I think they're already there and they want to be collegial. You know, there's no backstabbing in the tanks, of, you know, is what the chief Saul say, but uh, it's something that that's gonna be reckoned with, I think, in the next probably 12 months. A reminder, if you're watching, if you have a question, please feel free to submit them on the uh, on the platform right there on, on, on the screen. Um, you know, I asked General Brown this, what, what, what is the, you know, what is the greatest threat to losing and in, 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 to losing great power competition with China and Russia? Meaning, is it, you know, is it, is it something that they're going to do is Russia and China is doing or something that the U S is not doing? Um, you know, uh, Stacey, you want to maybe take that and then Mackenzie get your thoughts on it as well. Sure. Um, I mean, I think it's obviously uh, China and Russia have both developed uh, military strategies and concepts of operations to exploit American weaknesses and the typical way of operating that we've become accustomed to since the first Gulf War. Um, and these include using large numbers of uh, conventionally armed ballistic and cruise missiles to attack air bases and surface vessels. Also attacking our command and control, our um, ability to see things, our intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, and our uh, space assets, our GPS, um, degrading that so that we can't have the exquisite precision that we've become accustomed to and the communications that we rely on so heavily going forward. Um, they've also denied us air superiority, which is really important for operations across all of the domains. I think the effects of losing would be um, dramatic. Um, the, the, not just the Air Force, but much of the Department of Defense is much smaller than it's been in the past. I mean, the US has historically often gone into wars unprepared and lost and recouped over time. And it's not clear here that you could. And a lot of the scenarios that the department is focused on and that people worry about are ones where adversaries are trying to achieve a quick and decisive victory. So you don't have time to turn the tables anymore. You've lost and you've lost a tremendous amount of force structure or lives 
hurt economies um, and that there, there isn't any uh, ability to recover, the U.S.'s reputation and standing um, would decline dramatically and not really be able to be recovered. So the chief talked about in the document, he says, you know, that our competitors are posturing aggressively to first contest U.S. air superiority, reconnaissance, and strike capabilities in that order. So he's trying to, you know, send up flares to, for those problems specifically. And then he talks later about the need for airmen to better understand Russia and China, like as, as countries, as nations, as ideologies, as, as a people, as a society, as a culture, as a language. And uh, he talks about, you know, the ruthless prioritization. So it can't just be about contributing to the new, you know, joint war fighting concept, but it has to be understanding their theories of victory, their ways of war, their force development strategies and, um, and designing our cap capabilities with that in mind, not just sort of what can our system do and how could we do that better? It's, it's a totally flipping the tables over if it's possible um, to do. And that's, I, I think he, the other chiefs share his viewpoint on this. I, I, it's really just a question, are they united with themselves against all the other forces arrayed against them? Or, or is this thinking that can permeate civilian leadership too? You know, General Brown's coming to, from to, uh, to the Pentagon from the Pacific, and um, you know, I know we talked on, on, our, on our prep call a little bit about how he 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 shook up the way the, the Air Force is operating out there. You know, what are what are some of um, you know kind of some of what you know uh, his uh, ideas, if you will, that that he had there? How how can they be applied more broadly to the way uh, the, the Air Force deploys? globally and perhaps how you know how, how about um what do you think that he'll bring to the to the tank and to his fellow joint chiefs and uh, you know how might he uh his vision of the world uh you know how might he get his fellow chiefs to uh buy into his vision of the world and stacy or or mckenzie either of you can go for that one I think he's he's got a lot uh, to bring that you know in the Pacific there's been an emphasis on dynamic force employment and this is more broadly within DoD um, so posturing forces in different ways where they move unpredictably and they go to locations where they typically don't operate instead of just permanently sending them forward like um, they had done previously in, on Guam with the continuous bomber presence. Um, and things like that, where you just send forward a rotational presence and it de facto becomes permanent. And um, they think that this unpredictable sort of activity and deployments is uh, harder to plan for and can potentially have the same deterrent effects, if not more, while um, uh, reducing the drain on the force in terms of uh, hurting readiness and, and causing um, a lot of force structure to be postured forward and tied up with these presence missions. Um, I think General Brown also brings a lot from his time in the Middle East. He alluded to this, but he was uh, an Afsan and CENCOM. And in, there in that capacity, he oversaw the operations against ISIS and actually saw how the different services work together um, to defeat that enemy and some of the problems that emerged um, between them as they, as they tried to, um, to uh, battle ISIS without committing a large number of ground forces. And that was an instructive um, experience and highlighted some of the areas where the Air Force uh, needs to um, brush up on some of the skills that it hasn't used as recently and some of the issues that it needs to work through with other services before they go into any sort of um, prepare for major combat operations against a great power adversary. Mm -hmm. That last point, Marcus, uh, what, what he talked about before in his last job, but it's obviously a thread that runs between the, the, the jobs in the two regions, is what he has seen is that the services, they bring their individual platforms to bear as part of this global force management, but I call it like a military Jenga puzzle where the services are putting in and then they're pulling out various parts without fully understanding all the risks. And I think what he's seen is sometimes this hurts the other services, i.e. the Air Force in particular. So he, th that is one of his rationale and his reasons for asking for more discipline about the use of force for any reason. And he wants the Air Force and the other services to be able to say no to themselves 
and for civilians to restrain their appetite for these, again, these presentations. Is there any, how, do either of you have a sense of how China and Russia are responding to these, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, unpredictable, as we call them, de deployments? Is, is it, is it causing any type of alarm there or is it kind of just a, a shrug? I'm not a regional expert, so I don't want to. I don't want to start speculating that accord. But a lot of this is fairly recent. You've seen uh, in the last few months a number of different bomber deployments. So right. I think folks are still in the process of assessing what the response has been. Um, I would say just you know, looking at correlations, you're seeing that in the Pacific, at least, China is still pushing lots of aircraft towards Taiwan and the normal sort of jockeying that's happening happening in the East and South China Seas is still going on, um, but the status quo hasn't shifted much more than that, so. Well, yeah, you know, like you mentioned, you mentioned the bomber deployments and we, we've seen that both in, in Europe and, and, in, uh, and in the Pacific. I guess what, uh, either, either uh, Mackenzie or Stacey, what, um, what do you think, what, what, what to you, I guess, would be a significant, um, you know, dynamic force employment. Either, either one of you. I mean, you're seeing them use them in really interesting ways where they're trying to pair up different uh, bomber platforms together, the, together where they have the B-1 and B-52 operating, coming in, showing them doing different things. We've seen in the past over like North Korea, where the US has had a B2 pop up to um, send a strong message um, in a way over North Korean, you know, near their territory where um, it would be alarming. And I think that these, the signaling is something that the department and the Air Force needs to think through and, and to continue to do and be careful with and test and watch the responses of both uh, in Moscow and Beijing because. Um, in Moscow in particular, they're, they're very concerned about uh, what they call American aerospace power and bombers, um, uh, especially the B-52 and uh, the B-2 are nuclear capable. So uh, there's there can be inadvertent messaging that goes on. But right now, it seems to be showing that they can go different places anywhere in the world. They have the global reach. Um, this is getting to like Air Force uh, slogan about global reach, global, global vigilance, global power. We've seen them fly over Africa to signal, I think, to the Russians with what um, they're doing in Libya, Libya with the Wagner Group. And they're kind of just showing their ability to swing across the globe really quickly and to operate in places you haven't seen them before. So they're forcing both adversaries to sort of recalculate and assess what the, what the U.S. is planning to do and what it's actually capable of doing. I was just going to briefly say, Marcus, you know, last year, the Air Force was a bit surprised when China and Russia conducted their first ever joint strategic bomber patrol. And it was a, it was a real eye-opening moment. And just one, that they were doing it. Two, with the types of platforms and capabilities they were bringing to bear. Three, in the location of the world where it was and what they were attempting to do with us and arguably our allies. So for us to sort of reverse that and do it back to them, I think is really an example of being smart uh, to, to show them that we can do it with more allies more often and more better <laughs> uh, and, and in more places. So um, General Brown and I talked about the, uh, you know, the 386 number, uh, 386 squadrons and whether or not, you know, um, I mean, I, 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 personally, you know, he said he needs to review it and everything. So it, it, it seems that, you know, subtly the Air Force has backed away from that 386 number, um, even if they still say it, even if they still say, oh, yeah, that's still there. Does it need, does the Air Force need, uh, you know, a bumper sticker, if you will, for bombers, for fighters, stuff, you know, to, to kind of akin to that 355 ship Navy of which, you know, everybody in, in the Beltway seems to know and hear about often. Mackenzie, I like your wonder. question, Marcus, and I, I saw where you were going with that, and because the Navy has been successful in getting more attention, in some cases more dollars, uh, definitely in getting newer systems online faster than the Air Force certainly has been doing, particularly with aircraft. Ironically, the Navy's had 
significantly greater buys of newer aircraft over the years, the recent years in the Air Force. Uh, so now the flip side of that coin is then when you have a number like 355 ship fleet, uh, the whole town can you know jump all over it when you can't get there from here and which the Navy cannot, although they have a brand new uh, emphatic partner in the Secretary of Defense as of just you know last week and this week talking about um, the service needing more money. Uh, for and sure. apparently, according to Politico today, the National Security Advisor is taking a keen interest in the 355 ships himself. So, yes, uh, yeah. this is uh, Robert O'Brien's first passion is U.S. Navy shipbuilding. I can tell you from experience. So um, even long before this job. Uh, but right. So it can hurt you as a service, but it could, I, I honestly haven't seen I've seen more help than and good come from bumper stickers since that's really all the time that decision makers often have, policymakers and politicians in particular. You know, members of Congress might ag agree or not agree that 355 ships is enough, but what they do agree is that we have a 12 carrier Navy and a 15 carrier world, which Navy leaders have, have often said. It would be helpful for the Air Force to be able to talk about it in simple statements like that. I know it's oversimplified, but it's better than nothing because uh, that's that might only be the 30 second elevator ride pitch you get to make. Stacey, have you, has, Rand, has Rand done any work to look at kind of, uh, you know, force structure and kind of what, you know, what the right makeup, say, of, of, of bombers is? We, we hear bombers thrown around a lot just because B-21 B and, you know, there was, I think, what was it, 80 to 100 at the beginning. And then now, you know, at least 100, I believe at least 100 is what, what you hear now. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the discussion with General Brown, we had, we have an argument from a uh, one of our op-ed contributors saying, you know, that the Air Force needs, uh, you know, a new convention, conventional bomber. Um, kind of when you look at force mix, I guess, what uh, what uh, recommendations, I guess, or uh, what are you observing? What type of recommendations would you make? Um, we definitely do. A lot of that isn't publicly available, um, and it depends. Most of it ends up being pretty detailed modeling sim simulation that's focused on one particular scenario. So you have to extrapolate or do a larger study that um, is going to look across the globe at the cumulative demands, which um, we also sometimes do. Um, I don't have a specific number in mind, um, and I think it is changing because the concepts that the Air Force thinks that they're going to be using to fight are changing and evolving. Um, uh, the Air Force warfighting integration um, capability has really, uh, FWIC has been pushing on new warfighting concepts. And these are using non-traditional platforms in a mix with traditional ones. So they're, looking to operate in very different ways. And that uh, I think makes it harder to specify exactly what you need. It's much easier and you've seen um, some, of, some of my colleagues like Dave Ackmanik's been foot stomping for years and years, the need for more munitions. It's not just the platforms. We don't have enough long range um, anti-ship missiles that bombers can fire. We don't have enough long range um, anti-radiation missiles that we can use to go after enemy air defenses area munitions to um, destroy tanks. So there, there are sometimes the less, um, the, the not big ticket items that nobody really lobbies for and cares about, but that are really critical to these fights that we're missing. And there could be investments in those areas, in addition to some of the new uh, sort of non-traditional platforms um, that they're looking for. And, uh, uh, how about how about roles and missions? We we we've touched on a couple of, of uh, a couple of those uh, throughout throughout the discussion. Are, are, you know, you think of the last twenty years and the number of uh, roles and missions the Air Force has assumed. The you know the the, the drone mission being you know perhaps probably the the largest. Um, you know, as, as you as you look to the future, uh, Mackenzie, maybe start with you. Are there are there are there missions you foresee going away, particularly as you know the shift to China Russia? Um, I mean, I'm thinking coin. I'm thinking lots of uh, lots of, of of what has been the norm, I guess, over the last twenty or so years in the Middle East. I, I do, and I think he'll be the the chief who pushes uh, the most strongly for moving forward. There's there's some momentum building in pockets of DC for a. A real role, roles and missions, not a necessarily a congressionally imposed one, but from the bottom up within the department. You know, so for example, you know, there's 
There's brewings of a inner service dispute between the Air Force and the Army. Uh, and a senior civilian is going to have to adjudicate that about should any service be able to pursue by any means deep strike you know, capabilities? And do we have the funds for duplication? Do we have the time? Do we, can we afford that luxury? Uh, maybe, maybe we want duplication. I don't know. I'm not the decider, thankfully. Uh, but what I thought was really interesting in the, a, a good bumper sticker, if you will, in the chief's um, document was that he said, you know, we're having these budget pressures because of the pandemic and other issues. And the worst outcome would be to cut defense funding without adjusting the strategy, strategy or priorities. This would amount to sequestration by another name. And he is not wrong. So if I'm him, I'm, that's exactly, I, I understand that I can't take a couple dollars over here and a couple dollars over there and think that we're going to make any wild swings in Air Force investments. So he understands that you actually have to stop doing things. It's more about stopping than taking on, although potentially there is potentially, um, again, another roles and missions discussion about ICBMs and the third leg of the dryad, two of which, of course, the Air Force own and operate. Uh, but really, it's, it's, what, it's not just you know, what platform can be divested or terminated, although he talks about that. But he also talks about, you know, if distributing risk more equitably is what we agree on, then we have to be candid about what each service is going to do or not do. And we have to, again, that term that S Secretary Esper uses and Jim Mattis before him, have ruthless prioritization. Stacy, you know, Rand, Rand has done some work, uh, as you pointed out uh, to, to me yesterday on our prep call uh, with uh, base defense. And I know I think that came a couple of times earlier in our, our discussion here. Uh, to talk about a little bit of, um, talk about that. I know you guys have done work specifically involving Europe and base defense and, you know, how, how that gets prioritized and, you know, whether that's a mission that, you know, individual services need to be doing at their, their own bases or, uh, you know, the Army has to do or how, how uh, what, what, and the type of, I guess, argument or fight that's going to play on uh, as this, uh, as the services debate this base defense. Absolutely. Um, so Alan Vick led a study last year that was just recently published on air base defense. And as a part of it, they looked at sort of the inter-service rivalry surrounding this because the Army and the Air Force have had a um, recurring debate about this issue. It's one of the areas where there's a misalignment between the stakes involved for the services and the responsibilities. So the Army is responsible for air base defense in most respects, but it's the Air Force that relies on them to actually generate combat power. Um, and this has been coming to a head with the increased threat to air bases in both Europe and um, in particular in Asia. And uh, one of the challenges and one of the things that um, Vic and his uh, co-authors considered was that the Air Force might want to try to reach an agreement with the Army whether they could assume the role of point defense for air bases. So this isn't PAC-3 like Patriots or THADS, that's theater defense. It's really cruise missile defense. Um, the, that's, the Army has been interested in it and they were supposed to acquire the IFPIC system, but that was gonna be mobile and be moving with their maneuver units, um, which makes sense, that's their priority. The Air Force needs it at its bases to actually shoot down the uh, hundreds of cruise missiles, if not thousands, that could be coming in. And uh, there's a question if the Army's not going to actually acquire this capability, um, should the Air Force be the one that's allowed to, so it can defend the bases that it really needs to project power. And as I think you go forward, what Mackenzie was hitting on really well, with budgetary constraints, some of this becomes more acute, but even I think a lot of the concepts that you see floating out there right now, multi-domain operations, JADC2, um, all the different um, buzzwords uh, are involving pulling together sensors and shooters across domains and across services. And um, that is, it's not clear who's going to be doing that. Um, the Air Force wants to be the integrator with JADC2, um, but the Army, feels like that, uh, that an ABMS won't necessarily scale. They see every soldier as a sensor and shooter and that you re require a, a very different type of system. Um, so I think there are a lot of issues that they're all going to have to work out if they end up moving forward with some of these more ambitious concepts that are focused on um, passing information and better connecting sensors and shooters to each other. 
So uh, we have time, I guess let's, let's, we can end on this one. And for both of you, what are some ways that the Air Force can collaborate more with each of the services? And uh, let's start with Mackenzie and then we'll shift to Stacey. Uh, sure. So I think knowledge, uh, sharing knowledge is their best weapon at this point, uh, and primarily through uh, one, through the use of airmen, just line, you know, flight line airmen talking uh, about this in their own words, but saying similar things. And, and But really, the Air Force will have achieved, I think, uh, great leaps forward when the other services talk about why they need a strong Air Force in particular. Uh, when OSD has the services back on things like ABMS and JADC2, you know, if you listen to Air Force leaders between the lines, they will tell you, we are doing what the nation, Congress, uh, the civilian leadership have asked us to do, basically buy down more of the defense strategy, to buy more of it, to buy down risk. And we, we do that and we hand up, these, hand up these options, which we carefully considered and consider, uh, thought think are the best avenues with the lowest risk and they're constantly shot down. And so you can understand the frustration. It's not just on Capitol Hill, it's in the building. So uh, I, I think once they have more allies uh, through knowledge, and I think that's how you get cooperation is the more that they're aware of, you know, really the last 20, maybe 40 year history of sort of Air Force modernization in the past that they've been on, it'll be, they'll have, it might only be out of sympathy, but they, they'll have more friends, I hope. Um, I agree with that. I, I think that there are sort of two levels of uh, cooperation that you would be important and necessary to actually yield um, significant improvements to how DOD can fight. One's at a more of a working level, and that's uh, holding joint war games and experiments, and they're doing some of this. Um, uh, we were involved in the multi-domain operations war games for TRADOC and ACC several years ago. Um, and, you know, despite having lots of soldiers and airmen in the same room together, they still kind of speak different languages and talk past each other. So I think that if these concepts that are going to bring together their domains are really going to work, there has to be a significantly improved understanding at all levels and actually testing these ideas in war games and then going the step further and figuring out in the field how they're doing these small tests to figure out how they link up and how they're gonna actually work, what the weaknesses of these um, concepts are and how to correct them. And then I think at the senior level, you need um, collaboration among the chiefs and among uh, senior leaders across the services. They have to buy into it and to actually um, encourage those at lower levels to to go along with it. Um, you've seen sort of in the past with airline battle being pointed to as the one example of Air Force Army cooperation that was still somewhat stillborn because the Air Force never signed up actually to the doctrine. It was Army doctrine. You know, they, they kind of halfway um, uh, get, get married, but don't go all the way. And uh, you, you needed that support at the higher levels. And so I think at both levels, you can really improve things, establish relationships, and help them to understand each other, and um, hopefully result in a better joint force that is actually capable of completing the missions and the um, tests that it's given in the NDS. Well, on that note, uh, we, we are out of time for today, but I want to thank, uh, thank you for tuning in. I want to thank Stacy and Mackenzie for joining me. I want to thank General C.Q. Brown again for joining us earlier. And I want to uh, tell our audience that make sure you register that on Thursday, September 24th at 11 a.m. Eastern, we'll have the next event in our State of Defense series with the State of the Marine Corps, uh, featuring a keynote interview with General David Berger, the Commandant of the Marine Corps. So thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time.